Thank you, everybody participating. Uh, it's always a pleasure to meet you and hope we're going to give you an inspiring hour. Revenue Forum is a non-profit initiative started by me in 2008. Currently, we organize webinars. We hold these on Thursdays every six weeks. Half-day seminars. We did them in 10 cities in eight countries and hope to start again this year. And whole-day events. This is a unique hybrid event held simultaneously in Stockholm, London, Milan, and probably more cities throughout the world. The next one is planned on the 7th of February. Do note this in your agenda. The topic of this episode is winning strategies, a revenue manager's advice, and we have invited an expert panel and a hotel expert to talk about their view on the subject of the subject. We will close off the hour with a panel discussion. Participants to this webinar are a broad mix of listeners from all over the world. There are hotels ranging from two to five star, independent and large brands. We'll try to make this coming hour inspiring to all of you. Special welcome to those in the States and Asia. Good morning or good evening to you, depending on where you are. Our experts panel consists of five speakers and a hotel expert. Hot, uh, expert speakers will get five minutes to talk and we will use a Pecha Kucha format. This means that the presentation slides automatically change after 20 or 30 seconds. Let me start with into, in the introduction of the first speaker, which is myself. My name is Anna-Marie Kubanski, and apart from being the organizer of the Revenue Forums, I am founder and CEO of Tactical Consultancy and of our soft brand, Tactical Hotels. Today, I will talk about our journey the past two years. Now, let's see, Michael. Yes, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael McCartan. I'm the Chief Growth Officer at Atomize. And today I'll be talking about the power of automation and more specifically about how automating pricing, uh, tactical pricing decisions has helped uh, Robin Hood Inn and Suites outperform the market during uh, the turbulent past two years. All right. Hello, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. My name is Nicola Dare. I'm the Director of Revenue Management Services and Product Management at SHR. And today I'm going to be discussing getting back to basics and how to return to our core revenue management principles as we move through recovery. Hi, I'm Eric Munoz from Libra. Libra is part of the Zucchetti group of companies. And today I'm simply going to be talking about winning strategies. Hi, my name is Niels Meckenkamp. I work for Sendine. We have a host of products that we supply to the hospitality industry. And I'm going to talk about ethics and revenue management. Hello, my name is Juan Olaya. I've been working in the hospitality industry for the past seven years, especially as a general manager and a revenue manager for both Lavanda Rooftop Hostel and its placement zone apartments. And today I'm here to share a little bit of my experience regarding these topics. Thank you all for that. Uh, Juan is our very special guest, and we will interview you after uh, all the Peche Cuches. Well, this is always a very uh, nervous start of, uh, of, of, of the webinar because, well, uh, Peche Cucha is always a bit of a, of a stressful event. Uh, and I will, as I said, be the first one to, to speak. Well, okay, I think I am ready. My name is Anna Marie Gubanski. And I am founder of Tacticon, which is a consultancy special, specialized in revenue management and distribution. I'm also co-founder of Tacticon's Hotels, which is a soft brand for independent hotels. In these five minutes, I thought to tell you about our journey the past two weeks, two years. Applying revenue management helps increase results by 20% or more during normal circumstances. During the pandemic, our focus was to increase market share for all hotels, where benchmarking reports were a vital, vital tool for us. Not all, all hotels suffered. Our hotels located outside city center actually reached all-time high. Most of our competitors, uh, customers are independent hotels where the properties have been within the family for generations. When the pandemic came, we understood how hard this would hit them personally. We contacted them to tell them that we would be with them throughout this journey and help them in any way they needed. 
We would take care of front desk and breakfast if they so wanted. The result was that they all stayed with us, though to our disappointment, we never were asked for breakfast duty. We were quite looking forward to that. At the same time, the Swedish government decided that companies could only get support if they would reduce man hours, and this was a big challenge for us. We needed the support, but we could not reduce man hours as we still had the same number of projects. We had to be more time efficient and we had to do it fast. One of the time consuming morning routines revolved around updating our daily diary a revenue tool in Excel. It only takes five minutes per hotel to update, but five minutes times 40 hotels means a, bit of th means a bit over three hours per day. We found developers who helped, could help us have an automated version of our tool. This was the start for, of quite a journey. You know how we revenue managers are, give us a reporting tool and we would demand a rocket that can fly us to the moon. So soon we were asking for accurate forecasts, uh, valid price points, pickup statistics per segment, distribution channel, profit groups, and more. Our revenue tool, Rev Diary, was born, and our developers had sleepless nights trying to keep up with us and all the improvements we wanted to make. Forecasting during pandemic was quite a challenge, as the whole hotel industry quickly found out. But our tool would not be optimal for us without good forecasts. Though exceptional times gave us the opportunity to test under exceptional conditions, which turned out to be an advantage. We could use our revenue management forecasting skill. We knew that we needed both internal and external statistics and do comparisons between both pre and post pandemic. Um, pre and post pandemic demand, sorry, using on the book statistics, pick up per segment, recent trends, competitive strategies, benchmarking numbers, and so forth. Forecasting, but with the help of automation. The next challenge pandemic gave us was to adapt our pricing strategies to uncertain markets. For none of our hotels, we could use the pricing strategies the way we were used to. Lead times and market mix changed. Some hotels were based in locations where price wars were going on, and some hotels saw an increase in demand and increased rates. Finding the optimal price point is key, and this optimal price point can often be on a room type which is not available anymore, or on one of the larger room types. To have the right price point open at any time, we asked our developers for a model which enabled us to show the optimal room type attached to the optimal price point. Another well-tested revenue management application is to use buckets, where rates are grouped based on ADR per rate code. What we did was to group them according to the net results. Combining this with an automated and accurate forecast, it meant that we could act faster and smarter in working towards the rate mix, giving us the optimal net results. This enabled us to remain profitable, help, us, uh, help our hotels to survive, but mostly it helped us to survive and save money by being more effective. We've had a fantastic result from our tool, tool which helped us gain 40% increase for several of our hotels and gain market share for all of them. The real test comes now when life finally goes back to the life pre, uh, 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 we were used to pre-pandemic. And we'll see how quickly the tool can adapt to the new, new normal, because that would mean that we have a tool which will be able to help us throughout the rest of our lives. Wouldn't that be great? I'd like to close off my uh, uh, speech with key, uh, some key uh, takeaways. As said, in my view, you cannot perform revenue management without a good forecast. That, uh, this gives you the opportunity to have a clear strategy for each day. Contrary to what many think, it is a creative job. And you can test different types of strategies, but it also involves daily and structured routines. Most importantly, follow up on the result of your strategy so you can keep improving. And that was the end of my five minutes for the webinar. Even though we woke up this week in a realization that part of Europe is at war and that can impact us negatively, I wanted to close off with ex expressing a positive feeling. Let's not forget we are coming out of a time of pandemic and restrictions finally look like they will be removed. From our company perspective, we feel that we come out of this period much stronger than before. Uh, with the help of new tools and a brand new soft brand to, to, to help us along the way. 
and well, I made it. So I uh, hope you enjoyed my five minutes. And let's see if our next speaker, Michael McCartan, also is ready. Michael, are you, are you there and are you ready? I am here and I am ready. So let's go. The COVID pandemic has forced many hotels to ask uh, if it is possible to do more with fewer people, to use technology to unburden their teams, make day-to-day -day operations more efficient, and facilitate the convergence of commercial functions. But what does this mean from a revenue management perspective? To illustrate how superior results can be achieved without the complexity historically associated with revenue management systems, I will share the story of the Robin Hood Inn & Suites, who by automating repetitive and time-sensitive pricing decisions have given themselves a competitive advantage. In 1963, the Robin Hood Motel opened its doors in beautiful Victoria on the southern tip of Vancouver Island. In 2017, a full renovation was undertaken to implement the physical, technological and strategic changes needed to set a new standard for value and services offered in Victoria. Renamed the Robin Hood Inn and Suites, the property is a favorite amongst local and international travelers thanks to its wide range of included services and its outstanding facilities. Since taking over at the Robin Hood in, uh, in 2017, Sam Kirsch, the GM, has implemented several changes that have drastically increased the property's performance. These include adding a variety of new services, upgrading the facilities, and offering a range of experiences that guarantee guests have an unforgettable stay. Sam was equally forward thinking when, it, when upgrading his hotel's tech stack. As a mid-sized family-owned property, the Robin Hood staff have always had to wear multiple hats. But Sam recognized that having the right tech tools at their disposal would allow them to be more efficient, improve the guest experience and increase revenues. Sam and his business manager, Pink Yu, set, up, set about identifying processes that consumed large amounts of time that didn't add significant value to the operation and set about automating these with the help of technology. For example, the Robin Hood was the first hotel in the area to offer live chat to guests via all major messaging platforms. At this time, the team at Robin Hood adjusted room prices by conducting manual research and rate intelligence to get an overview of demand shifts and their competitors' prices. This consumed a lot of valuable time and only offered a limited static picture on which to base pricing decisions. This manual process only allowed the Robin Hood to maintain a booking window of two, two months into the future, since tracking dates and updating prices further in advance was too laborious for the small team. The search for an RMS was already underway when the COVID-19 pandemic hit. The travel market's ongoing volatility only added to this requirement. Sudden demand shifts became much more common with frequent changes in travel restrictions. Having to rely on manual research and data collection made it very hard for Pink to ensure the Robin Hood rates always reflect, reflected the latest shifts. They used to lose lots of time and revenue opportunities when they didn't immediately detect a new trend. It also meant that they had very little time to do strategic analysis and planning. Sam was aware that legacy hotel technology systems have a reputation for having a steep learning curve and thus a low adoption rate among staff. He did not want this to be the case for his properties, RMS. When looking for a new solution, he wanted one that would be both comprehensive and easy to use. He found a tool that provides live market insights, or in Atomize, he found a, a tool that provides live market insights and real-time rate suggestions in an easy to read and highly actionable format. Atomize automatically tracks live market de developments and immediately adjusts the rate for every situation. Data inputs such as search pressure and competitor rates are taken into consideration when optimizing prices in real time. To enable the Robin Hood team to do even more with less, they decided to activate autop the autopilot function. So all re pricing recommendations are automatically accepted and pushed to the sales channels. This saves valuable time and helps Sam and Pink work towards their strategic goals more, more efficiently. For example, when the travel restrictions for the region were lifted last June, they immediately saw an uptick in demand. Atomize reacted and adjusted their rates in time to make the most of the, the development from the start. 
The Robin Hood team invests part of the time they save into refining the management strategies and testing new, uh, new approaches that will boost their hotel's uh, revenues now and beyond. This is borne out in the numbers. Clearly, pricing automation has been very successful for the Robin Hood, but I will leave the last word to Sam, and we'll listen to a voice message that he left. Alexander, it's Sam Kirsch calling from the Robin Hood Inn and Suites. Um, I just wanted to tell you that we have, we got the stats in from uh, STR, plus we've done some analysis, and I think you're going to be really happy to hear this, and we're absolutely thrilled. Um, our best year September in for September for the month of September was in 2000 I think 18, and we are fifty dollars over on Revpar from that period. Um, it is it is brilliant, and um, yeah, just wanted to share that with you. Uh, and I'm absolutely thrilled to share it with you. <laughs> Take good care and enjoy the rest of your week. Bye. Thank you. I, I did it too. A little bit stressful, but uh, we got there. And uh, yeah, so if, if uh, I'll be around to answer any questions, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Michael. It, it's so nice to end your uh, your uh, speech with uh, such an enthusiastic, uh, uh, enthusiastic customer. I mean, you can almost hear that he's almost emotional, right, uh, in his, in his uh, things to you. That was a really nice uh, closure. Thank you. No okay. Well, uh, here we have Nicola there. I hope you're ready for us also, Nicole. I, th I think so. <laughs> um, all right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening again, everyone. And let's go. So savvy revenue managers know that beautiful, intuitive automation is key for delivering in the following areas. Process efficiency, analyzing extremely large data sets, and performing routine and predictable or definable tasks. We can think of this as that 80% share of the 80-20 rule. The ability to automate is a necessity for today's lean teams and revenue managers whose time is better spent outside of day-to-day -day reporting, monitoring, and routine rate yielding. However, it's important to remember that other 20% or human judgment integration is key for addressing events that are so recent they have yet to have an observable impact on data, events from the past that are not expected to occur again in the future and why, and future events that have yet to make an impact. I'm sure that sounds very familiar to all of us from the last two years. It's something that we've been dealing with nonstop and we're going to continue to address as we move through recovery. If we go back to the most basic definition of revenue management, which is delivering the right room at the right price, at the right time, to the right guest, and I know there's about two or three dozen more right parameters and qualifiers that can and, and have been added to that definition. How do we take what we've learned from these past two years and apply it to a future that continues to rapidly change? We can expect our guests and their reasons for travel to look very different coming out of these last two years, and the current data bears this out. According to Expedia's Q4 global data, three points should stick in the minds of all of us as hoteliers. One, Q4 stayed room nights were down 31% to 2019, but ADRs were up 23%. We're gonna come back to that one. Um, there's a continued mix shift towards lodging and more specifically vacation rental versus air. And the vacation rental summer bookings are pacing ahead to 2021 and 2019. So this data tells us more people are traveling locally or regionally, they're looking further ahead as restrictions are lifting, and they're looking for different experience than they used to. Your hotel needs to strategize pricing just as much in the vacation rental space as within your traditional comp set. You need to be monitoring vacation rental rates and inventory in your area, listing on vacation rental websites where that's supported, and focus on service your hotel can offer a guest that vacation rentals cannot, like security, 24-hour front desk, on-site F&B, spa, mid-stay cleaning, as well as your amenities. Our own data shows that hotels with a guest recognition program saw ADR lift despite offering their guests special offers and discounts. Why? Because guests were incentivized to book direct and buy add-ons that contributed to increased ancillary spread. 
So hotels have gotten very creative during COVID in utilizing and adapting their space as they continue to shift towards total revenue management. And these are gonna be important to continue to reimagine as travel rebounds. So one thing that's here to say is workcations. People are working remotely and are more mobile than ever. So you need to consider offering and pricing for these long-term guests. Emphasis on keeping in mind the age demographics to build base business where you might be lacking corporate and contracts. All right, back to that first data point and the fact that the Q4 ADR up is up 23% versus 2019 while occupancy is significantly down. What we are seeing is that while right now there are fewer people traveling, those who are traveling are not price sensitive. And Europeans have a historically high savings rate coming out of the pandemic as well. You can see this recent data from the IMF that shows households utilizing the Euro saved almost 50% more over the last two years than they normally would have. Hotels have done an excellent job holding rate during this travel crisis. And it's important to remember that for many, this was not an economic crisis and the recovery is gonna look very different than it has for past crises. What this means for your hotel is that it's especially important to not get bogged down in a pricing war. This is not the market to differentiate based on price. For many of us, this is a market to differentiate based on offerings and the experience that you can bring to your guest. Proper packaging with local experiential offerings and excursions can help your hotel avoid competing on price. Dynamically managing your add-ons and ancillary item pricing to incentivize buy-up and drive incremental revenue. You don't charge the same rate for your rooms regardless of market situations, so why would you be doing that for your ancillaries and add-ons as well? You should be applying the same data analysis practices to, to those revenue streams so you can answer questions like, what is the conversion rate for late checkout? Can I charge less on days with fewer arrivals and increase production? In conclusion, travel will come back and it's going to come back with a vengeance. Our guests, their motivations and their needs have changed substantially over the last two years. The core tenants of revenue management have not. You need to be automating your predictable tasks, your reporting, your day-to-day -day rate monitoring so that you as hoteliers and revenue managers can devote your strategic focus to delivering that right room or offering at the right price to the right guest. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I love your positivity also in the, uh, the way you present it. And yes, you are so right. We really, really, really need to keep on focusing and, and uh, well, travel is coming back. It's very interesting to see if there's going to be much of a change because now we're going to see also who is going to travel. Thank you. Uh, let's see if Eric is, is there and ready. Hi, yeah, thanks Anne-Marie, and thank you, Michael, Nicole. It's been very interesting, and uh, let's keep the show going, let's go. So winning strategies, that's the topic for today. Obviously the winning strategies relate to the hotel business, specifically hotel revenue management. So what I'd like to share with you is different um, scenarios, contexts, terms, things that we deal with in hotel revenue management today, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm gonna adopt a different approach. Obviously, I'm following the Pecha Kucha style, but I'm gonna add another layer of complexity, another twist, and make this a Pecha Kucha Wordle presentation. If you're not familiar with Wordle, it's a word game, a really cool word game. Basically, every day you've got to guess what is the five-letter word. You have six attempts to guess the five-letter word. How do you know if you're correct or not, or you're getting close? Well. If you've got the right letter, but in the wrong position, it's going to be yellow. You can see there on the screen, if you have the correct letter in the correct position, it's green. And if it's, if it's the wrong letter in the wrong place, it's not even in the correct word, it'll just remain gray. So it's a pretty simple concept. And I guess for many of you here now, maybe you already are familiar with Wordle. If you're not, it's a really cool game. If you hate the idea of Wordle, there are other um, derivatives, almost a hundred different Wordle derivatives including Nerdle. Nerdle is a number-based, mathematically-based game like Wordle. So for example, rather than five characters, you have eight numbers or mathematical expressions to, to guess every day. What I mean by that is, for example, three plus four plus five equals 12. That's eight characters. Let's start. COVID. None of these letters are correct. 
and we don't like the idea of COVID, so I'm very happy to disclude this as a word. However, COVID affected 2020, 2021. So in your pricing spreadsheets, in your revenue management models, you need to look beyond 2020, back to 2019 and earlier, in, to ensure that your models are analyzing data and trends that are more relevant to pre-pandemic. And continuing on, trend is not the correct word, but R is the correct letter. Your trending data is an important input into your forecasting and your price optimization and other revenue management controls. So you need to adapt looking beyond last year's data, back three years, but also what are the new data sources that we can use and how can we, how can we better use those data sources to perform now optimally in these new conditions? So trend is something to be very mindful of. And when, as it relates to price, that's not the correct word, but the R is still correct. With pricing, I really want you to be uh, mindful of the change in conditions. We cannot rely on what last year's performance was as an uh, indicator of what will happen now. But we need to know, for example, real-time pricing right across all our different room type categories because guests can book at any time of the day. So your optimization needs to factor in price changes across all of your competitive set on a real-time basis, not just one price update today for the next 30 days. And value has never been more important as guests have also changed and guests have adapted their priorities on cleanliness, their priorities on safety, their priorities on following the right protocols and how they perceive your property meeting those needs as well as pricing and let's call it reputation data. They need to be combined so you understand the true value of the guest's perception for your property versus the market they, they're considering as an alternative hotel. So we need to be really mindful of how the guest is perceiving your property. Now, if your guest is arriving by plane, as we heard now from Nicole, that Europeans having a large disposable income, they are flying to sunny destinations. And particularly if it's three degrees like it is here today in the UK, we want sunshine. But how do the UK people versus the Spanish, the French, the Germans, the Swiss, the Danes, the Swedes, how do they vary in terms of their booking window, the length of stay, the demand for different destinations? It's super important if you have international guests that you have this data as well. And now Libra is the five letter word today. Libra is in fact the RMS that caters for all of these different scenarios. So we look at PMS data beyond last year. We go back three years of data. We provide real time rate shopping. So for all of your competitive set, for all of your room types, room only, room inclusive, uh, refundable, non-refundable, half board, full board, all of your different meal plans. We combine reputation data so you have a true understanding of the perception of value. And what are we working on right now? Well, there's more to be done. Point of sale, food and beverage revenue management is around the corner. We're also working on spa and health club revenue optimizations. And we've built something really cool called the Travel Data Lake. Today has around 60,000 hotels aggregated data, aggregated from PMSs, multiple PMSs, multiple booking engines, channel managers, um, special event data, flight data, all of that is aggregated into one repository, which is already making me quite excited just talking about it. And that is today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. For all of, the, uh, for all of you listening uh, who did not know about Wordle and start downloading it, uh, be prepared to get addicted. Um, I wasn't I wasn't aware of it until you started it, Eric, and I uh, I almost hate you for it, but then. <laughs> Uh, I think, uh, interesting, I think you're very, very um, uh, correct. Uh, we really need to look at what, what 2019 uh, gave us. And it's very interesting also on what Nicole touched upon, how, how and when is this coming back? Uh, we got an, an, a question from, from one of the participants on that. So we will get back to that also during the question and answers. When it comes to the, the, the questions, please uh, feel free to ask us anything and we'll take them up later. But for now, uh, Niels is there ready in the background, I hope, and I uh, that sounds promising. Well, Niels, if you're ready, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Anne-Marie, and uh, great presentation so far. I loved your creativity, Eric. Um, so let's go. The moment you make a mistake in pricing, you're eating into your reputation or your profits. This is a statement by Catherine Payne, a professor at Cornell University. 
And it's something that we often ignore or forget in hospitality revenue management. And this is something that is rarely brought up, but I'd love to talk about it. And that's um, why we do, or that's exactly what we do, because there are direct links between how we act and what the guest does in response. The most common remark I hear from guests is you always put up rates when you feel like it. Pricing is very important for us, and we feel that we need to be able to change our rates. But in the because in the end, Sony will change the price of their TV during sales, and even companies like Gucci or Louis Vuitton have sales. But this word sales is exactly where the problem lies. Guests don't see the rate reductions of those companies. They uh, or the, they only see the rate reductions of those companies. The problem that we have in hospitality is that we don't have normal or rack rates anymore. So a guest doesn't see the full price of a room. They only see the price changes every time. So if we show a guest how much discount they get from a full rate, this sends a completely different message to them. And this is why the OTAs love doing it as well. So by always pointing out the discounts that your guest is receiving, you remove this ethical problem that we always face. Another big ethical dilemma is overbooking and having to walk guests. You can imagine walking into a hotel only to be told that you don't have a room. But have you ever been in a situation at a hotel that you're at front desk and you have to tell someone that they're being walked? That's not nice either. So it's critical that, you have a, that you're very clear and open with your guests admit that the hotel has made a mistake and say that you want to help them. In my view, there are two key things that we have to do. First one is to try and offer people an incentive early on. If you know that you'll have to walk guests, it's better to walk guests early on, earlier in the day, than in the middle of the night after they arrive at the hotel after a very long and tiring day. Have a good, clear policy is another one. So offer guests a fair compensation for their inconvenience. And, you know, of course, don't try to overbook too much because you'll only be hurting in the end. The next thing is compl the complaint that I often hear is cancellation charges, early departure charges and no-show charges. People generally understand the no-show cancellation charges, but the early departure charges are harder to understand. Often this is because they don't really pay attention when they book or because we as hoteliers are simply not clear enough with our policies. So again, there are three important things that we can do in order to prevent this. First thing is to be very clear when guests book. Let them know that they're getting a lower rate because they're staying with us for longer. And if they want to reduce or shorten their stay, they have to play a higher rate. The second thing we can do is make sure that we repeat that on check-in so that when they check in, they're reaffirmed. And the final thing is you can remove all confusion by offering a longer stay package that is charged at check-in and that covers the full stay. So the guest pays a fixed price and that allows them to stay a maximum of X number of months. The final contentious issue I want to talk about is blocking out corporate rates. How often have you seen companies being upset they could not book their corporate rate? Now, we all have corporate business and we value their business, of course, but we have to be profitable as well and we have ownership to please. So relay this message to companies. They will understand, especially if you offer to work with them to find a solution together. I always recommend hotels to prepare a corporate demand chart. So if you highlight the periods that you will be busy and you highlight the periods that you will be slow, you will be show them when or when they cannot book their yieldable corporate rates. Then you can offer them the option between choosing more flexible, uh, higher rates or lower, more restrictive rates where they can benefit greatly from having the flexibility if they have the flexibility when it comes to travel. But the other option is, of course, these higher rates. So in the end, all these things have one thing in common, and that really is communication. Because what you need to do is talk about those reduced rates and not about your best rates. 
Be honest to your guests and explain to them what you're doing and why you're doing it. Be very clear about your terms and your conditions and show that to the guest. And finally, present and discuss the options as much as possible to either your corporates, but all people involved. Hopefully, scripts can hope, help you a little bit, uh, being a little bit more ethical in your business practices. Thank you very much. Niels, I think you touched on quite a number of things that a lot of hoteliers actually uh, will recognize the thing like, OK, I'm, yeah, there's a guest that you need to you, you need to turn them and the excuses that you make. I think your, your, your point is always be honest and be open with your, what, your, what your policies are, right? Yeah, and be clear. Mm. OK, thank you. Well, actually, we've uh, we've had all our five expert speakers and I think it's time for our um, our special guest, Juan Olaya, and I think I pronounce it uh, 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 wrongly. Sorry for uh, sorry about that, Juan. You pronounce it perfectly, Emery. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, thank you for joining. Uh, before before I ask you a few questions, could you could you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do? Yeah, of course. Well, first, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here. It was a pleasure hearing all my colleagues talking about this uh, interesting topic of revenue management. And to give you to give you a little bit more of my background, as I said before, I've been working in hospitality for the past uh, seven years. And especially I've been working at Lavanda Hostel as a general manager, as a revenue manager, but not only that, I started serving drinks in the rooftop and prepping meals. And at the end of the day, just bringing the vibe to the place. And little by little, I started getting uh, more responsibilities um, and the owners of the place also got uh, started a vacation rental uh, business, Space Mason, for which I was also the revenue manager on the general manager. And as of today, I started my freelancing hostel consultancy and revenue management, and I onboarded two more properties for which I am super happy and, and super proud. Oh, congratulations to that. Uh, by experience, I can, I can say it's very, very, very nice starting something for you. Now, in the pre-meeting, um, we, we discussed a little bit like, okay, what are we, what are we going to talk about? Uh, and when Niels was talking about like that, that he wanted to, to talk about ethics in revenue management, you immediately thought, mm -hmm. okay, I have, I have a few things I want to I wanna say to that. But then, um, so if you, how would you balance between lowest and highest rates? And how would you ba balance uh, value versus price maybe for your properties? Yeah, I think that's a great question. It touches a little bit of what Eric was mentioning on this presentation as well. And for me, I had to face the situation both as a general manager and as a revenue manager. When I'm designing as a revenue manager, the master rate plan for one of my properties, it always comes to the point where we have to set our floor and our ceiling prices for depending on the type of accommodation. And that's always a sensitive topic because sometimes um, hoteliers and want to go be below certain price and it's super important that we talk to them and try to get as, as much data as possible of their PL so they know for real what's their lowest bottom price and we as revenue managers we have to try not to ever go below that and know when this is a specific few days a year when there's no demand at all and we know if we break that that flow we can drive occupancy much higher when it's almost nothing going on but not to try to take that as a as a regular practice and then on the other side also especially on the hostel industry we had and i'll talk about some specific uh situations last last year we had a big bank holiday in sevilla they I usually price quite aggressively, knowing especially the market from, from before. So that day there was basically not a single bed in the whole city. And uh, we ended up selling beds over the hundred euros, hostel beds for a city like Sevilla, which is like a tier two city in Spain. It sounds crazy. And that comes the second part of the question, how you pair value with price? Because obviously from a, an objective point of view, a hostel bed is not, the price is kind of be hundred euros. So how you try to get that guest that is coming to your property and is super excited because it's coming to a, a really cool place but he's paying so much money so i think it's super important and a few of my colleagues also touched this point before that driving and trying to get this extra value to the guest it's really important we have other things to play around 
nowadays accommodation is not only a but you're not offering only a room no you're not offering only a bed we all have food and beverage which is a super important part of the of the business and it could drive our total revenue management way higher than it usually has been so as to give an, a specific example at the hostel what we decided anytime me as a revenue manager and the front desk detects that there is any rate over a certain uh, a certain rate they automatically offer free breakfast and a free meal so when they come and they we don't tell them we wait until they come and in the check-in process to give even more because what neil said is super important being honest being clear reception and front desk is in no charge of rates but it, they are in charge of being able to give you something extra to make your experiences more memorable. And at the end, they want to get a unique experience and something that stands out for just a nice bed or a nice room. So that would be some of the things that I would face when I have to come uh, together with these things. Interesting. So as a revenue manager, you just give away things for free. Yeah, but I think it's, it's an interesting thing, yeah. But then you, you touch on this, like um, uh, restaurant, also the extra extra revenue that you can earn. Uh, in our experience also in hostels, you can actually have additional uh, revenue, housekeeping, but also restaurants, as you touched before. Do you, do you have, do you have any, any best practices, any more best practices to give us there? Yeah, so in, in this particular case, and especially in small boutique hotels, independent hotels or, or smaller hostels, um, sometimes a uh, restaurant is just an extra thing, maybe they do once uh, uh, a week, they do a little uh, dinner, maybe the volunteers do it, so it's not that much of a, a regular practice, and we, what we decided uh, at La Banda a few years ago is like, let's try to do this every single day, let's try to market it as the thing to do while you're here like you're not going to go to eat fantastic tapas and amazing tortilla and amazing samorejo in the city maybe you do that during the day but during the night we want you here we want you to have that extra experience get to know our staff get to know all the other guests and at the same time having an affordable option for a really nice homemade dinner and together with the bar so they spend longer time with us they have a memorable experience and um furthermore it's really important to have a, a good, good offer on events as well, because maybe just nowadays, the restaurant next door could compete perfectly with whatever cocktail, and even though it's an amazing mojito overlooking the cathedral on the rooftop of Sevilla, but still, there's not something else. So what we did at La Banda, and a particular thing that we did, was offering live DJ sessions, we offer live music, flamenco performances, open mics, art exhibitions with local artists, and try to blend a little bit the local talent, which is plenty in many, many cities, with the possibilities of what we could offer. And that also not ended up increasing from zero, because we didn't have this, to over a 30% of our total revenue uh, as, as of today, but also helped us providing a better experience for our guests and people just extending and they're like i'm having such a great time that i'm not going not going to granada i'm staying here at la banda a few more time a few more days because i want to have try the paella that you have on sunday that i haven't tried yet and the live music everyone is talking about so all these little things help driving even more your total revenue i think it, it sounds like a really 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 nice property that might also help right you're all welcome <laughs> um I want to have like the, the, the final question I had uh, had to you is like um, automation has been a topic of, of, of a few of the, the speakers here. Um, what is your experience, um, maybe also your challenges when you try to streamline your properties the best way possible? Yeah, I think automation, it's uh, that big leap of faith for most smaller, independent, medium-sized uh, properties, which look at the big uh, players and everything is optimized, all these fancy tech company names, and you're like, what do I decide how we stack all them together? Can I actually afford it? But I think in my perspective, both again as a general manager and now as a revenue manager, it changed my life. First from the change uh, of having a really not automated, not good PMS to a newly uh, PMS, which was fully integrated by when we changed and it keep on evolving. It basically changed our life and changed the, the approach we had on managing the whole property. 
and also managing uh, the whole rate plan, rate structure, how we dealt with all the daily tasks. It's time consuming, it's boring, it's uh, always open to manual and human errors. And at the end of the day, it drives you crazy, you know? Uh, for me at, at the hostel, it was a huge positive change. And then uh, the apartments, uh, when we made the decision to jump onto our RMS, it was like day and night. Uh, having the possibility of having a tool, which is fully automated, has an algorithm that is based on overall occupancy on your comp set, what the, your, your competitors are doing, and also the pace and the pickup real time. This is a game changer because we talked about it before, my colleagues talked about it before. If there is a sudden change in demand for a particular day, maybe in Sevilla we had this recently, uh, the, the final of the Copa del Rey, a big sports soccer event. And suddenly in, the, in one day, all this reservation coming in, you don't have an automated process, you're losing tons thousands of years of revenue. Luckily we had, and property owners are super happy. And just to uh, continue a little bit with the, with the talk and the op general optimism, optimism um, this past two months, we increased uh, the year on year uh, profit um, compared to 2019, because for us, all the forecasting, I do it versus uh, 2019, on the, it was around the 20 and the 30%, both hostel and the vacation rental apartment. So I foresee good times, better times. And yeah, it was a pleasure being here today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for, for joining us. I mean, it's always so nice to have somebody from the industry to also talk about, uh, well, what the challenges that we have. Uh, actually, you touched upon the technology. I think, uh, I mean, to the year 2022, and we still have technology uh, with different systems not really talking to each other, a, a, a challenge in, in finding the right technology. I think it still is a challenge, and I'm, I'm glad that you're, 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 uh, you're starting to solve it. Uh, I decided to have a whole webinar on it, maybe somewhere, somewhere later in this year. I think it's, it's in uh, September, because it is an issue for hotels. Well, uh, maybe we can see if there's a few questions in the Q question and answers, and maybe I can also just like ask the, the other speakers to, uh, to, to join us. We did get a few very nice questions, so let, let us maybe start with, uh, with these. Um, the first question we got was, uh, and Eric also replied to that, uh, well, maybe uh, there are more people that want to reply to it, but this is really a very interesting question. It's like, what do you think then when tourism and hospitality business comes back to the normal level as of 2019? Um, Non-specific uh, question to any of the, of, the, of, of, of the speakers. Do you have like a good idea about that? Or do you give it, get a like a consultant reply? It depends. Eric, you had a reply to that. Would you would you say would you would you try to summarize what your reply was to the question? Yeah, yeah. So th there are hotels, uh, many many hotels that are already trading at or beyond 2019 levels. Nicole shared that data in her presentation, I believe. Um, so Michael's presentation, the Red Robin property they're they're trading above their best month which was september 2018 if i remember correctly from the presentation so i would um categorize hotels at a very very macro very high level those properties that are very leisure oriented those properties that are more corporate oriented now being clear um cities like new york and london are absolutely a mix they have equal if not very competing levels of corporate and leisure business at all times of the year. But, so I'm talking about properties that are primarily in leisure destinations. So um, seaside, mountains, mountain area, and let's call them rural, rural environments, probably a two to three hour drive max from a major city metro. Those are destinations that I consider primarily leisure oriented. They're doing super well. They're doing extremely well for the obvious reasons that it's a car drive. It's close enough to make a nice weekend or even a longer holiday. And so they're, they're thriving um, and they've been thriving throughout this pandemic, depending on their restrictions that have been imposed. Um, and on the flip side though, corporate hotels, so hotels that have minimal uh, leisure business. So let's say a big convention type hotel in the US, 
just primarily mice type of business. I, I really don't see those returning to their 2019 levels for obvious reasons. You know, a lot of very big organizations have restructured the way they do business. They may never have considered a remote first type of policy, but they were forced to. And surprisingly for some of these organizations, they, they actually thrived. Employee morale went through the roof. Everyone was more productive. Some companies are even thinking about moving to a four-day week. Quite a significant change, which I think these changes may have happened in, in 10 years' time, but the pandemic accelerated a lot of these behavioral changes that we've, we have personally as private citizens, but also for corporate travelers. So I love ITB Berlin. Niels knows I love to share a beer with him whenever we meet face-to-face -face at WTM or different events. Like nothing, for me, nothing will beat the face-to-face -face interaction that, that we um, enjoy in our lives as well as in business. However, I just see that people have adapted like everyone attending today. Attending a webinar is no big deal. It's easy. Uh, you can turn your camera off so you don't have to fix your hair and get dressed, right? It's super uh, manageable and it's now way more common and, and not such a big deal. So I think there are quite logical repercussions um, to the detriment of hotels that are primarily corporate oriented, but you know, they can reinvent themselves. They can um, look for new business as well. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my thought on that. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of, been a lot of discussions on this corporate travel. We also got a question about mice, for instance, and I think, um, in, in many of the properties that, that are corporate oriented, actually we do see that they are coming back. Um, and I also wonder, um, I mean, the, the corporate travel that, uh, that I think uh, is disappearing is the, the corporate travel that has been just like traveling back and forth. And maybe um, uh, these day travels that you see in, 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 in Europe quite a lot, maybe I think the transport industry will, will, will find that maybe much more than the hotels. We see also extended stays, stays on corporate travel. It is coming back. The interesting thing is actually, is mice coming back? And I think, well, you, you, you made a point. Yes, okay, there's much more online uh, mice. On the other hand, um, you also make a very fair point. Uh, people want to meet, and I think this still is going to go on, but then maybe these very short meetings, these just like, um, let's just talk about the project and see for next step. I think these kinds of meetings might disappear, and I, I, I agree with you also that uh, they would have disappeared anyway because we just fast forwarded it. Yeah, thank you. Let's see if we can have maybe some more. Um, Anna Maria, I just wanted to add one thing. I think, you know, the the online meetings and the online trade shows that we've seen i've attended about 15 now and every single one of them has been a disappointment for me because you can't get to speak to people it is a it is a confusing format people are missing so it's it's a disappointment so there's i think it'll go back to real real life very soon but what I think is that we, you know, forget about 2019. Uh, you know, people saying, yeah, we should compare to 2019. I don't believe so. 2022 is going to be completely different than any year that we've seen before. And every single hotel needs to look at the future more than look at the past. And, you know, if you if you try to, to sort of emulate every single hotel year that I've spoken to is surprised about what's happening. See, so a change in business mix. And this is something that we need to focus on the future and not try not to dwell on the past and let's move forward and, and you know, unfortunately not look back. I think you're quite right. I think you're quite right. Uh, there's also another question uh, that has to do with the, the current situation, Ukraine, Russia, which is like uh, accelerating very fast. And this also comes maybe to a question I thought maybe to ask you, Nicole. Um, she talks a little bit also about forecasting. Do you have some specific advice uh, regarding forecasting? And would you be able to link that to maybe current situation? Yeah. Cool. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's a tough question with everything that just kind of escalated this morning, right? I, it wasn't unexpected, but it, that's kind of a, a separate question with regard to forecasting because we don't yet know. And this goes back to that whole concept of 
the, the human judgment integration versus what a computer can do, right? No one knows yet how long this is going to last, what the impact is going to be, what if any, you know, and what those spillover effects are. Um, so I'm going to leave, I'm going to park that for a second. And I want to talk your question about forecasting specifically, something that we are really focusing on with our revenue management clients, because we, part of what our company offers is outsource consulting, right? So we have um, hotel clients that we just work with on strategy. And I know this is a huge concern in the US and I would think probably in other markets as well, is our hotels for short-term forecasting, it's so, so important that you are in contact with your ops team and you are monitoring your staffing and your staff availability because what a lot of hotels are seeing right now in terms of short-term forecasting is pricing is they can't sell all their rooms because they don't have the staff to service them. So it's really, really important that you are every day having those conversations with your hotel so you know, well, I have 200 rooms, but I can only sell 150. That's going to impact that short-term pricing strategy quite a bit. Right, so you need to be very active in that and keeping track of that ops forecast along with that demand forecast. Um, I may have to, to punt specific answers about the situation with Russia and Ukraine to some of the other um, attendants as well, because I just I don't think we know yet. No, I think uh, there's a lot of questions about about that also. Also, maybe the policies that, that are changing. Um, there are a lot of questions and we're not going to be able to answer answer them all. Uh, but what I will do is I will just like try to see if I can uh, formulate a few answers and send them to you after the webinar because I really, really, really love your uh, your uh, engagement, uh, all of the participants. Thank you so much for 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 your uh, your reply, um, uh, Nicole. Um, I did have one final uh, final question, maybe to Michael, because there's a lot of talk about about automation. Um, uh, you talked about uh, how market conditions have changed, um, sorry, uh, how um, uh, automation uh, can help with the tactical pricing. Um, how can it help also with strategic planning, you, you think? Yeah, so I, I, I see tactical pricing and sort of strategic analysis or strategic planning as sort of two sides to the same coin. Um, so they're both equally important. But they're different, um, and 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 you know Nicole alluded to the situation in Ukraine now. That's very volatile, and you can't you you know you, no matter how much analysis you do on what's happening there, you just can't predict what's going to happen. You're 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 not going to draw any conclusions from that. So being able to respond in real time to short term um, changes in in market demand is where you know automation of the tactical pricing can really really you know come into its own. But that doesn't preclude or ignore the fact that you do need to do strategic analysis on your business to understand longer term trends, to understand more about your guests, the profile of your guests, etc. So whilst at Atomize, we're exclusively focused, probably possibly the only revenue management solution that only focuses on tactical pricing, uh, we partner with business intelligence experts that you know, they understand that domain much better than we do. Uh, and they will provide you multi-dimensional uh, analysis of your business to really come up with a view of what's happening in the future and how to position your products and how to capture more of that, that, that demand. So short-term tactical pricing really in response to sudden and, and um, short-term changes in the marketplace is, is very helpful, but you need to supplement that with much better business analysis on based on historical data and trends, et cetera, et cetera, to really understand how to position the property and market yourself to those guests. Thank you very much for that. I totally agree. Um, may, maybe I can close off with uh, a few of the questions that we received. Uh, great tips to increase hotel profitability uh, was one of the ones that I would really like to react on. Uh, and I would like to react on, so that depends, but then you're talking to a consultant, right? Um, but I think, you know, um, in my perspective, there's, there's two things that, that, that are vital in the hotel industry. First of all, it's ha know your distribution costs. Um, and I also sometimes think that we talk a lot about the OTAs being the bad guys and very expensive and let's just like drive direct. But don't forget that we sometimes we need like a distribution diversity 
but we always need to have a look at, okay, what is the real cost of distribution, the extra cost as well, and not only commission, but also um, uh, the, 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 the systems that we need in order to distribute. That's one thing. Another thing is we can talk about pricing as much as we want, but sometimes I think um, for our properties, what helps best is actually the inventory management. Make sure you always balance your room types, that you always have your room type available at the price point that you want to have available and it just sometimes means it means upgrading or um, uh, doing whatever but then uh, or overbooking maybe a certain room type but make sure that you're always bookable on the right price point so price is one thing as said but inventory management is another make sure you have all your inventory open and available it's all we have time for today. And I feel really bad because I mean, um, uh, I promised to close off at about four o'clock. It's always uh, already after four. As said, I will, I, will, I will stay a bit and I will chat with the people that want to chat with me. So stay on people that have a, have a, have a, a, a question. And for those um, uh, speakers that uh, have time to help me in chatting with our participants, please do so, uh, because I'd like you to all feel that you get an, a, a, re a reply to your, uh, to your questions. But a few people want to leave and I can also understand that. So let's just like uh, see uh, what we're going to do in the, in the next webinar. Uh, it will be about the future of loyalty programs, so completely different. Uh, speakers are going to be from Toxicon, I reckon you, fans. SHR comes back again, but with a different uh, speaker and upgrade too. You're very welcome to, to join again. It's, uh, as always, free of charge and hopefully very, very, very inspiring. Uh, we will send you a recording of the of the webinar uh, as soon as possible. Uh, any final re uh, re remarks, maybe from our speakers before we turn off? I think I just want to state the obvious that obviously you've got our email addresses. You can see the correct spelling of our names. Um, so LinkedIn, obviously, don't be shy. Please feel free to connect, um, and we can continue discussing these questions that may or may not have been covered or, or anything else for that matter. I think I speak on behalf of all the speakers that we're happy to connect via LinkedIn. Uh, um, thank you for that. Uh, Michael, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I think uh, certainly my principle and, and uh, I think Juan touched on this, you know, um, hotels should look to see their internal processes around where the friction points are, where where they're spending a lot of time doing repetitive and sort of tedious tasks, and automate those tasks that can be automated. I think there's a an ecosystem now that speaks much better to one another, and 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 really can help in in automating a lot more of those redundant tasks. Yeah, quite right, Nicole. Anything to add there? Oh, excuse me, I just lost my voice here. And there's one echo, Michael and Eric, and there's there's a, a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge on this call. And please, you know, connect to everybody on LinkedIn. Um, we're all here from a you know from a tech perspective to, to for SHR. We always say we're going to simplify your life as a hotelier. That's what we're here for. That's what the technology is here for. Um, so thank you all for your time today. Everybody, stay safe. Start traveling. Restrictions are lifting, um, but take care. Uh, Niels, anything to add there? Um, I can again echo uh, everything that uh, that Nicole, Michael, and Eric have said, and and you as well, Amri. Um, but I think you know the one thing that I always say is is keep focus on your guests, keep understanding you know what what is it that your guest wants, and make sure that you're very clear in your messaging, as I already said. Uh, so now, thank you very much for for having me. Okay. Thank you for, for joining us, Niels. Juan? Well, thank you, everyone, um, for showing up, for sharing all this knowledge. And I would encourage um, our friends, hoteliers out there to not to be afraid to take that leap of faith and to trust uh, all these companies that are out there. Because when you realize how much 
time money you were wasting not to taking this step forward uh it is um, making your life easier and focusing on what neil said making your ha your guests happier yeah and i think my final word is actually uh i can i can i can only repeat what neil said earlier look ahead um life might go uh, somewhere back to, to what we were used to 2019, but uh, we are going to live in a different world than what we, ha what we have been used to. But keep on looking ahead and keep on looking also at a positive way, because the moment we start panicking uh, with any situation, that's also the moment that we start to make bad decisions. You all, decide, uh, all um, survived the pandemic, nothing is going to stop you. Thank you so much for, for, uh, for participating. It's always uh, fun to organize this. It's always fun also to see that there's so, so much engagement. So thank you, participants, and hope to see you also in, uh, in, in April when we come back with uh, talking about loyalty. Thank you so much.